Good afternoon. Hope everybody's uh, excited to be here. I'm in bright lights in big city. Uh, my name is Adam Englander. I'm an engineer at Iovation, uh, and I'm here to talk about something that we've recently done uh, using Jose to secure our REST API. So I want to, first I want to give a, a little bit of a background about myself and APIs. Uh, so maybe you can hopefully think I know what I'm talking about a little bit. So this is what I looked like when I started writing APIs. That was a long time ago. Uh, it was so long ago that SOAP was the new hotness. That was a long time ago. Uh, and my career, I've, I've actually spent, which is kind of odd as a PHP developer, I spent more time in my career writing APIs than I have building websites. So since uh, 2001, I've been working on a lot of different APIs. Um, my first one was a global authentication service, although that was Java. Uh, and then I started doing a lot of stuff with APIs in PHP with a loan application ping tree and a loan management system. Uh, worked for, on an advertising network API, which is really my first uh, attempt at a really high volume API. Uh, and then a real-time loan risk assessment system, which was an API that just talked to other APIs. So I got to experience how difficult it was to make a good API, and at the same time consume other people's terrible APIs. Uh, and in 2015, I started working for where I'm working now, which is uh, LaunchKey, now Iovation. And, and I work on a decentralized multi-factor author authorization API. It's a lot of words. And through this time, some are more secure than others. I, I, I'm a little embarrassed to say that I was in FinTech and I was working on actual financial stuff, that was nowhere near as secure as it should be. Uh, I, th I thought I was doing the right thing. When I started to work for an actual security company, I learned just really how bad it was. Uh, but neither of those were hacked, so, uh, and they've gotten better since I left, so I, I don't feel too terribly bad about it. But in all of these APIs, and maybe you've experienced this yourself if you're writing APIs, auth and crypto was messy. When you add the auth to the message, it adds complexity on the back end, it, where you have to be able to parse the message to be able to just deal with the fact that someone is giving you credentials. When you remove it outside of the message, you lose context. You're not quite sure what it's, what's going on with what it's actually trying to authorize for. Uh, every implementation was specialized. Every time you did it, you did it differently. It depended on uh, what the application was doing, what you needed to accomplish, so every time, yeah, even in the same company, when I would move from division to division or just one app to another in the same group, how they did authentication was different. How they did encryption, if they did it at all, was very different. How you validate the request and the response was very different. And crypto was non-standard and static, uh, which meant that if you wanted to upgrade your crypto, that you had to completely change your API, which is not great. Because um, if you've been working in, uh, in development for a while, you know that, hey, when I started working with PHP uh, in that 2005 API, it was perfectly okay to use things that we would not consider safe now. Absolutely fine then, terrible now. I mean, there was a time when a SHA-256 password was considered super safe, right? We know that's just not the case today. And, and the worst part about it is, is that non-experts like myself had to write a lot of code that dealt with cryptography and signature verification and message validation and authentication authorization, um, which is not great. I, I'm not a fan, um, and I was, I mean, I was not a fan of doing it there and having to learn everything, but the little bit that you can pick up trying to figure it out isn't super helpful. So for me, 2015 changed all of that. Uh, IETF RFC 7523. It may not mean much to you, but it meant a lot to me. Uh, and that is the JSON Web Token Profile for OAuth2 Client Authentication Authorization Grants. Big, long word. Um, but what that meant is that uh, JavaScript object signing and embedding or encryption went mainstream. And uh, this talk is primarily around Jose, which is the JavaScript object and signing encryption. Uh, and the reason it was such a big deal is that this was an RFC where authentication, authorization, encryption, uh, data integrity validation are not tied to the protocol. So if you look at all these other RFCs, they're all basically tied to if you're making this kind of request, then this is your authorization. 
It's very rare that you have a gigantic specification um, that's not based on single sign-on um, that is around how to encrypt data, how to transmit data, how to verify and validate information, how to authorize um, and how to authenticate that has nothing to do with the, the, the underlying implementation. And it was used initially for OAuth, OAuth 2.0. It was added as an implementation for OAuth 2.0, which then became OpenID Connect. Um, OpenID Connect is based on that. And it was also um, actually earlier, a little earlier on adopted by FIDO. And if you don't know what these things are, it's not a big deal. It's a big deal to me because if you add in one more acronym called SAML, that is every authentication protocol in the modern world. So with the exception of SAML, which uses some terrible XML, um, all these other things use Jose, this JavaScript object signing and encryption. And because they did that, what they did is they created, uh, I mean, there's a lot of IETF standards, but they added credibility, stability, and longevity. Right? OAuth is not going away. <laughs> OpenID is not going away. FIDO may or may not succeed. Uh, we're still finding out. I mean, my company's a member of the FIDO Alliance, but nobody's ever actually brought anything out uh, really big. Uh, but this meant that I could use this without worrying about whether it's going to go away, if it's going to change drastically. Right? The fact that when you log in with Facebook, you're using Jose tells me that I don't have to worry that they're going to have some gigantic breaking change when they find this little bitty bug that destroys the world with security. So that was exciting for me. And so when I got that, we, we decided that we wanted to use this inside our launch key product. Um, and a lot of this talk is about a case study on what we were, what we became, and how we went about that uh, using Jose. Because it really transformed our entire API. And to give a little background, so LaunchKey is a multi-factor authentication and authorization service, which means you use us to authenticate, which means it needs to be super secure. <laughs> it's got to be super secure. And so version one, uh, the before time, uh, started off about four years ago. And, and it was a, the data was REST-ish. Um, it was a really poor representation of REST. Uh, didn't really use HTTP status codes very well. Uh, put a lot of terrible things in the query parameters that broke the 1024 master uh, uh, protocol limit. <clears throat> um, it was mostly form encoded requests, mostly, not all, for post, put, and delete, and it had JSON responses. So the data was kind of a mishmash, depending on what got slapped on here and there. Sometimes you even had like credentials in the, in the uh, when you're passing JSON, there's, I think there's one endpoint and the old one that passes JSON as the data and the encryption and signature is actually in the query parameters. It's really, it's really unpleasant. Um, and it, but it still exists today. Uh, credentials, so it had siloed credentials for entity types. So uh, if you needed, uh, if you had two different things you're interacting with, an organization level or an application level, you had two sets of credentials and you just had to use, know which one you're gonna be interacting with. Uh, it used random integers for identifiers. Um, passwords were sent in an encrypted package. Uh, and password rotation with old passwords expiring one after the new password was generated meant that we'd have to hash for your new password and your old password, and if one of them was good, we were okay. Wasn't great, but it, but it worked. And for cryptography, we had good cryptography. It was RSA OAP 256. Um, we used AES 256 DBC and had really good SHA-256 RSA signatures for portions of the package. But because of the limitations on what you can encrypt using RSA, sometimes you did it in AES, which meant that you had, um, you had to have a shared secret for that to actually be, uh, work, because it's symmetric encryption. And some of it, which was most of the application interaction, was uh, using RSA for encryption. So sometimes it was one, sometimes it was the other. You never really knew. Uh, and on the security side, it used, did replay prevention uh, using a requester ID and a timestamp. It did signature verification on the password the timestamp only, because that was the encrypted part. Uh, it encrypted the password the timestamp, and it rate limited by user ID and subject. So the good part about this, this API is that it was really secure. Uh, the API was never compromised. We had a bug bounty for four years, and it was never compromised. Um, 
It passed a ton of static and dynamic analysis by top security firms, and even, you know, we were recently acquired and we were in the acquisition market and had been uh, evaluated by some very large security companies, and we passed all their tests because no one's ever been able to fabricate an authorization, which is fantastic. But what we care about in this room, can you use it, right? It was terrible for usability. Uh, before I was working at LaunchKey, I, uh, I know some of the developers there. I've worked with them at the, at the FinTech job. And we had a little hackathon. And I was like, oh, I'm going to write you an SDK. And I spent a day in their office trying to write an SDK. And I did not finish in a day writing an SDK because nothing was the same. Depending on what call you made, depended on how the data was set up. Um, the encryption was different from call to call. Um, it was not restful. It just is kind of bizarre. Um, too many credentials to manage. I heard that a lot. So when I started working at LaunchKey, uh, my job was to help implementers implement our SDK. And no one could figure out which. I'd, I would get these chats and these uh, emails and people having problems, and it's, they're using the wrong keys in the wrong place. Well, that's, that's not their fault, right? That's my fault, because it's a terrible, terrible way to go about it. Uh, and there was no way to properly rotate your credentials. So if your RSA private key, you're afraid that it might have been compromised, you need to change it out, you're going to have downtime. Because you've got to go change it in your code, you've got to go change it on our server, one of those is going to get done first. And you're going to have downtime, which is bad. So we moved to version two. Um, it was almost awesome, but it was an attempt at making it better via open standards. And that's where JSON Web Token came in. It's the first time I really actually looked at it. Uh, because our, our lead engineer said, um, we're, we're going to use this, um, and we're going to use this on the mobile side, because that's what we had a lot of control over. We have a mobile app that we interact with. So we said, we're going to use JSON Web Token to do signatures and all this type of stuff um, with requests back and forth for the mobile side, and we'll eventually move everything else to that. Uh, and what it gave us is that we, we started using an open standard for data security. Uh, we added private claims for a hash of the body, so we had a much more, uh, we had a way better validation process. Uh, and we had a more secure API request format, which is all fantastic. JWT does these fantastic things for you. <clears throat> but we're still missing things. We were still using custom and inconsistent encryption um, because we weren't using JWE. We didn't increase the restful quality of it. We didn't sign uh, the entire request. Um, we just did the body. I'll get into that in a little bit. And we did not reduce the quantity of credentials. And we didn't improve the response. So the response just kind of came back, and you had to trust that that was the response you were expecting, that someone hadn't given you a man in the middle attack. Now, on our mobile device, it's not a big deal. We do certificate pinning. But for, on the other side, for APIs, as an as a implementer, um, doing pinning isn't a, a great thing to do if you don't know how to do it. And it's, it can be problematic when certs change, and you have to be kind of up on that. So we came up with API 3. We were acquired, uh, and we were told that we had to move from processing, uh, I think it was 3,000 requests an hour to 10,000 a minute, uh, which meant we got to rewrite our API. And when we were rewriting our API, we decided that, well, let's, let's do this right. Let's, let's go version 3, and we're going to actually do the security stuff right, because we're gonna have, since we're rewriting everything, let's not make it hard. So what we changed is everything. So we used JWT, JSON Web Token, uh, with custom claims to validate the entire request and critical portions of the response. We used JSON Web Encryption to encrypt the request and the response. We use uh, JSON Web Algorithms to future-proof our cryptography. We use JSON Web Keys for credential rotation, and we removed that little password that you used to send in the encrypted thing altogether, because it wasn't necessary anymore, uh, because we could validate all that stuff with RSA. And we got some immediate benefits uh, on the development side. Because we were able to decouple authorization, authentication, and uh, validation of requests and responses with the actual controllers. So we were able to move all that to middleware. So it, when, you, when we had to write tests for our controllers, because you're doing all this encryption and encryption, decryption, authentication, signatures, validating signatures, like that's a lot of things that you're doing before you even start processing the request. Um, but all of those pieces were part of the request coming in. 
So they were tightly coupled. And so now with Jose, you're allowed to separate that out where you've got this data that's part of your request that still has context, but it's not part of your actual request packet. And so in a stroke of genius, we decided we'll move it to middleware so that all of our controllers deal with is the fact that I've got a JSON request for an endpoint, and that's it. All the decryption, signature validation, determining what entity is making the request, determining that it has access to be able to do that, all that happens in middleware now from all the information that's provided in the JWT. Uh, and that gave us way better unit testing, right? I don't have to mock 600 interactions before I actually get to the code I'm trying to work with. We had controllers, and it's not all of security's fault, but we had controllers that were hundreds of lines long. Hundreds of lines long for, before it got to a single service. Hundreds of lines. It's really difficult to test that. And moving all of this stuff out made it so much easier to just add new functionality. Right? It would take days to add an endpoint uh, in the old system. In the new system, it, it's usually, if the service is already written to interact with that part of the data, it, it takes us 20, 30 minutes to write a new endpoint to be able to interact with existing functionality. So if I need to move it from this part of the, uh, this level of the API needs to interact with a particular uh, service and another level needs to do it, it's just super easy. I know I've already got the validation verification. I know if they have access to the URL, so I don't have to worry about that. I've got the entity interacting, and I just perform the interaction. It is really, really streamlined, and it's really, really awesome, because it, really, it was really difficult to make changes. The other good thing that I'm super excited about, OSS libraries. Um, I can now test my API, full integration test, without having to use my client SDK. It was so hard to write all of the code to do the signature creation and verification, validation, encryption, all that type of stuff. The, the only way that we could test our own systems was using our own SDK. So if we introduced a bug in our SDK, our test would fail um, or not, which was actually worse. Um, the client SDKs became less complex. I don't have to write all this information for doing signatures and encryption and decryption. And OSS contributions are actually possible now. Like we have, uh, I think, one contributed decent SDK out there that the community has contributed. Uh, it's a Go SDK. Um, but speaking from my own personal experience of trying to do that, I tried to implement a launch key SDK, and I couldn't do it. And I had the developers in the room with me, helping me, and I still couldn't do it. Not in a day. Um, and another one, I write all the documentation. I'm transitioning out of that, thank goodness. Um, but documentation complexity was reduced. You're just using this library that's already documented somewhere else. Super helpful. The other thing that it does is it creates uh, uniformity across our APIs. So now, in our organization, we're completely switching to Jose. We've got all these different ways to do authentication, authorization. But as an organization, they found out what we were doing. And in the review process, because we do peer review across groups, they said, that's, that's a way better way of doing this. We're all going to do this. Uh, and we actually, because we work together, we came up with a much better solution, um, which gives us shared knowledge, right? Because if you move from group to group, trying to figure out how you're doing auth is usually pretty tough. And, and now we also have the option for federated authorization. Um, and the other good thing is that because of the way the JWT works is it allowed us to using its, its own internal workings, use hierarchical auth authentication. Uh, because JWT has this idea of an issuer and a subject and an audience. And so what we're able to do is say, hi, I'm ABC organization. I would like to make this request for application one, two, three. I've got an issuer, I've got a subject. Inside of my middleware, without knowing anything else, I know that, oh, this is an issuer, this is a subject, I can determine if this issuer is allowed to make a request for the subject, and if so, I just pass it along, and I'm, my, my controller just knows that it has a subject entity. That's all it knows. It's just got a subject. Um, and it also allows us to kind of change it however we want with our middleware. Uh, and JWK, JSON Web Keys, allows for identification of the credentials used. So when someone says, hi, I'm issuer ABC, and I'm using this key, I can go figure out where that information is. And if there's information that I need to do that's specifically dealing with this other subject, I know how to figure out which credentials to use for encryption or validation or verification or whatever the case may be. And I can pass that 
from entity to entity to entity, and they all understand it. It's not something special that we did. The mobile side does this, and the app side does that. Before, all of our stuff was that way. But there is some bad. Um, some languages have minimal support for algorithms and strings. So we've had to actually submit pull requests for enabling AES 256, or sorry, RSA OAAP 256. Uh, it's not a requirement to be an implementation. It's, uh, it's an optional implementation. Some of them don't have it. Uh, some languages have no support for JSON web encryption, like Objective-C. Uh, we had to actually write our own minimal implementation for the stuff that we did. Um, and unfortunately, we didn't find that out until like a week before everything was supposed to go live, there was no implementation. But the good part about it is, is that there's some good documentation on that, um, that we have the tests that were necessary to actually write the implementation. So in the RFC, there's enough information that you can actually write an implementation and know that it works, which is really nice. Uh, and there's some good documentation, but unfortunately, as I discovered, you have to get a good working knowledge of RFCs. You have to be able to understand how, those, how they talk in RFCs, and if you've never done that, it's a little weird. Um, but once you get it, you're like, oh, that makes perfect sense. Um, and so that's what we did and why we did it, but how we did it is the really, really, really uh, cool part. So we did it with Jose, Jose, and Jose, right? It's all Jose all the time. Uh, we really, really jumped in head first, and it was super important. Um, and if you don't know what Jose is, it's, like I said earlier, the JavaScript signing and encryption, uh, but it also, it encompasses a bunch of pieces that are their own little worlds um, that what make up Jose, which is the JSON web token. Um, I know he's here somewhere, there's somebody giving a talk about, there he is. Luis is giving a big talk about that tomorrow. Um, so I'm not gonna get super in detail about JSON web token. If you, once you see my thing, you're like, this is something I really wanna do, Go see Luis's talk, and he'll tell you all about the JWT, because um, he actually writes one of the libraries. Uh, JSON Web Signature, which is for signing data, right? It's not signing any particular data, it's just signing data. Uh, JSON Web Encryption, again, is just for encrypting data. It doesn't matter what type of data it is. Uh, JSON Web Algorithm, and the JSON Web Key, which I misspelled with KW Key. Uh, a JSON Web Algorithm is basically just a list of predefined strings that identifies what you used. Right, so if you're using AES encryption, most of us probably use AES encryption, you're probably using 256, 384, 512, well, sorry, PHP is 120 or 256 most of the time. Um, and you're probably, hopefully you're using CBC. You might be using something else. There's a little string that says, I'm using AES, I used uh, 256 key size, and I use CBC as, as the mode. So that when you get the data, you know how to decrypt it, right? That's all about communicating what you did so that you can uh, do what you need to do once you get the packet from the other person. And JSON web key uh, is for identifying, giving, identifying information about keys, and you can even pass public keys along with the data. We chose not to do that. But the JSON web token is actually just a JSON web signature um, that has a specialized uh, payload. So in a, uh, in a JSON web signature, we'll kind of get into a little bit more. Um, but the JWT, provides credentials. Uh, there's an optional nonce that we use um, called the uh, a token ID. Uh, it provides timestamp information and duration for how long the request is valid. We were doing all of this manually internally. We we're all these pieces here, credentials, nonces, timestamps, and duration of the request. We did that, it was hard coded <laughs> into our code um, and we had to document it for everybody else. Uh, and that you could not change. If you'd say, I only want this request valid for 30 seconds, too bad, it's five minutes, right? Because that's what our code says. Um, but we were able to change that using the JWT. And one thing that you are allowed to do is you can extend JWT using private claims. So we extended it using private claims to add additional data that were important to us, which I'll get into that in a minute as well. So JSON web signature uh, has, basically it's comprised of three segments. And that can be expressed in a JSON object, which nobody actually sends around. Uh, or you can do compact serialization, which is three um, segments of URL, base64 encoded data separated by dots, periods. Uh, and so you have a header, and the header is common amongst JWT and JWE, and it provides information about the key. So what key did you use to encrypt this, or I'm sorry, signature, to sign this? 
What key did you use to sign it? So that I know which key to use to verify the signature. Um, what signature algorithm did you use? So I know to use the same one when I go to verify it. And also there's optional content metadata, which we also used to describe what's the information uh, in the payload. Uh, and the payload is the data to be signed. And then there's the signature of the header and the payload. So you take the header, you take the payload, a little period in between, you use your algorithms that you specified inside your header, you do a signature, you base 64 URL encode it, and there it is. It's actually fairly simple. JSON Web Encryption is very similar, although it has more parts. Uh, and it's also how much data in it is dependent on what you do. Um, it's extremely uh, diverse in, what you can, in the ways that you can do it, uh, but we took it to the absolute extreme because that's our job. Uh, we're a security company with a security, with a, you know, an authentication system that needs to be secure. Uh, and so again, you have the header, provides all that information, um, but it actually has two different pieces for encryption and algorithm. Because uh, doing JSON web encryption, um, there's a thing called a content encryption key. And what that basically does, and what we really loved about it, is that when you're doing content encryption, you can use AES encryption. So you're always using AES, right? Ever, most people are familiar with AES. But the important thing with AES is that you have a random initialization vector. This library handles that. The other thing that it does is it generates a random key. So everything that you encrypt, it gets a brand new key every single time. And it's using RSA, which is much more secure than AES, but it takes longer and has limited sizes that it can encrypt. It uses RSA to encrypt the keys. So you have the header information that tells you what you're using. You generate random keys and IVs. You encrypt the key. You put that in part of the packet. And then you make your encrypted data. And then you actually do an HMAC of all of that to get there. So the last pieces are the initialization vectors you used uh, for encrypting the payload, the encrypted payload, and then your HMAC. So that you can verify, it actually provides verification that yes, based on the key that's encrypted that people can't figure out, I'm going to sign the, all the payloads to make sure it hasn't been modified. One of the things we really liked about Jose is both the JSON web signature and the JSON web encryption they all have a signature to verify that it has not been modified. That's a really big deal for us. Uh, making sure that someone can't intercept the message between Citibank and ourselves and go and change the message so that someone can authenticate. We did some really crazy stuff to make that happen. Jose made that super, super easy. Uh, talked about a little bit already, so we use JSON web algorithm to standardize the format of expressing the encryption and signatures. Um, and you get the ENC and the ALG keys inside of the header, and that's where that comes from, and you'll see that in just a minute. Uh, and JSON web key, which is kind of, which it solved a real, real problem for us. Like we have a serious problem with key rotation. Um, and so it provides a way of expressing which key was used for this packet. And every packet can be different, so you have a key. Um, and the JSON web key information is stored in the header for the JWS or the JWE. And how we used it uh, is we used it to solve every problem that we had. And we literally solved every problem that we had. Right? So here's an example of a request representation. I hope you can read it. Um, most of it looks like readable. Uh, so this is like, here's a standard request. The only thing that may look a little weird is we've got this, you've seen the authorization header. Uh, normally, if you're using JWT, you're going to use a bearer token. So you would have authorization colon bearer space and then your bearer token. Uh, we didn't want to confuse people because we are not providing a bearer token. We're using a JWT, but it's not as a bearer token. So we gave it our own authentication um, format, which is also helpful for us in identifying what it is. So if we ever change the version, then if we're doing it differently, it can be IIV JWT2, um, or however you want to do that. And then you, you see that it's got the, the three segments. It's, much, it's very short. It's normally much longer than that, but it wouldn't fit on the screen. Uh, so you have three segments that are separated by periods. Uh, and then the data is your encrypted data that has five segments separated by periods, which again is really shortened. And, oh good, it is readable. Um, and so you have your JW header, JWT T header with your key ID, um, which identifies which key we, it used. If you, if you know this stuff at all, you'll know that that's an MD5 fingerprint of an RSA key. 
um, what algorithm we used for the signature, which is uh, RSA 256, uh, with a SHA 256. Um, and it's the type and the content type is a, is a JSON web token. And so for key rotation, that key ID, we provide in the request and the response. And for, if we're receiving encrypted data, you're going to give us the key that you used, our, pro our public key, and for us to know which one you used, you're giving us the ID. If we sign the request coming to you, we told you that we signed it with this key. If you don't have it yet, we give you an API endpoint to go get it. So now we can change out keys on systems that are high volume that want to cache the key. It's super important that you're not hitting our key, getting our public key every, for every single request when you're doing 10,000 requests a minute. Right? That's a lot of wasted time. That's a lot of, uh, a lot of horsepower going out making requests for something that you should already have. But it was difficult to do that because for, if we changed our key, when you cached it, then you could just destroy the world. So now you can just store the key forever because you know that as long as I get, I'm getting the key ID back and I can store in my key value store, I can store the key along with this ID so I can determine if I have it or not. And if I don't, I can go get it when I need to go get it and I can share that value amongst machines. So that was a, it was actually a huge performance increase when we started using JSON WebKey because you don't have to make a call like that every single time you call our system. And you can also get the current public key, which gives you an ID and the PEM format of your RSA public key. Um, so that's how we implemented key rotation using JWT. We had already had the ability to go get our current public key, but like I said, there was no way to identify it. There was no way to know if you had it already. Our solution on the version one was send a request uh, and we'll pass along the hash of the key. And if it's the same one, we won't give you any data back, so we, may, we send less data, but you're still having to make a request every single time to see if there's a new key. So now when you make the request, you tell us, hi, I use this key to make the request. And if that request hasn't been completely shut down, um, you can have multiple keys at one time, but eventually they will be disabled for security reasons. So if you send us a bad one, we'll tell you that it was an invalid credential, um, but during the time when we're rotating keys, you're not gonna have downtime, and you're not gonna have to worry about having the wrong key cached. And so, again, the way that we do that is we have the key ID, and then we have the URL for the public key. Um, the green sign is easy to make out of here. I apologize. So request authorization, we use it to solve that problem. So we do something a little bit different with a web token is we do a single use web token. <laughs> um, web tokens are normally, you're going to go to a federated authority. If you're using JWT, using something like OAuth2 or OpenID Connect, you go to a federation that says, hi, I'm the issuer of credentials and I'm issuing a credential for this person or for this entity or this application and it's gonna last for however long. Ours are single use because we want to pass those credentials every single time because we are the authorization service. Uh, and we use RSA key signature. Um, and we also have our hierarchical ACLs on, if, I'm a, if I wanna use my organization credentials, I'm, I don't wanna have to deal with the fact that I have another two levels. I just wanna use one set of credentials to use, deal with my 100 applications, which is actually really popular if you have a single sign-on system you have the ability to create and remove all of these other people that are using your single sign-on system, to create organizations, uh, a second level inside of your, our system for mapping to your system, and you may not want to have to manage all those credentials, you just want one set of credentials. And we use the token ID as a nonce, and we specifically use that nonce as uh, replay attack and making sure there's a man in the middle awareness. So, when you send us the, J, uh, the token ID and the request, we're gonna send it back to you so that you know that, oh yes, this is the response for my request as opposed to somebody sending you a pre-generated response um, or sending an old response and making it work. And then another big thing is the private claims in the request. Uh, so the private request claims are we add the method, uh, HTTP method and the path and a hash of the body, and the algorithm that we use to hash the body so that we know which one it is, and query parameters. Now the launch key API doesn't use query parameters, but that was added in for uh, the rest of the organizations that have query parameters. And so our JWT is not terribly readable, don't worry about so much, we'll go through each piece real quick. 
Um, but it's, it's fairly large. We use every single thing that you can use inside of a JWT. And then we add some. So hierarchical credentials is we have issuer, subject, and audience. So in this particular example, you have a directory, which is uh, basically if you have an authenticator, your authenticator has a directory of users. Um, and so you have a directory, and so that is your issuer, and it's making an issuer based on a service that, wants, that someone's trying to access. Um, and so we provide, we have UUIDs, and basically we've come up with a methodology where we can determine that what type of, per, what type of entity is making the request, how to identify that, which is the, kind of like the three-letter code, and then a UUID. And then the audience is LKA, which is the launch key API, so we know if you're setting it to the wrong place, we can just tell you that you're setting it to the wrong place. Um, Timestamp and duration. So the duration that we have is five seconds on our responses. We allow up to five minutes on the request. Um, so that we can have for, for larger windows. Um, but the thing that we do is we will hash the JWT and store it until it expires to make sure that you can't replay that same token ever again. Because between the JTI and the expiration, there's uniqueness amongst that. Every request you make, you may make a request at the same time, but you're going to have a different uh, JTI. Uh, and then because you're setting that, we can just very quickly just hash the, uh, the, the JWT, and we use that for replay prevention. And it will exist until the request is no longer valid. So when you have your expiration in your JWT, we'll hash it until then, because at that point, we don't need the hash anymore because the request is no longer valid. So that has really reduced the amount of information we have <clears throat> for our replay prevention, because your request is only valid for a very short period of time. So we've managed to really, really slim that down. And again, we have the nonce, where the JTI is the nonce. Uh, and you'll see in the response, it comes back. Um, and a nonce, you can give us whatever you want, you just, it just better not be the same thing twice, because you'll have a problem, <laughs> or at least not for five minutes. Um, and then we have request validation. And this is one of the big things that, that we did with this, is the request validation, is we created a subsection called request. And that's where we put the method, the path, the function used to, the hash function used, and the hash. So you'll see that the top is the first part of the request. So we know that it's a post request, and the uh, location is uh, service v3 auth, the path. And so we have represented that inside of the JWT. And that's how we verify that someone didn't, doesn't go and change a post into a delete. Right? <laughs> um, our old API wasn't restful because we didn't want someone to be able to turn a post into a delete. So delete was under a different path. So you couldn't just take the same request and change uh, the endpoint and do something terrible. Made it secure, it solved the problem, but as someone trying to implement that, it makes no sense to me at all that I should have to go to uh, service v3 auth slash delete and post to that to delete something, right? Not very restful. So being able to handle that inside of this request uh, claim removed all of that weirdness that we had to do to prevent that from happening. Response authorization. So one of the things we've never done before is we'd never actually given you the opportunity as a user, except for one small little piece, to verify that the entire response hasn't been hijacked in the middle. Now, the pieces that we did verify and encrypt were the things that would allow you to hijack a session. Uh, or to impersonate a user, or to make a service think that a user had responded in a particular way. So again, no one was ever able to actually uh, log in as a different user, or hijack an account, or do a man-in-the-middle attack that worked. But to do that, again, we had to just make things really weird, and it was really unwieldy as an implementer to try and figure out. So. What we changed to, and this is a little weird because you never see a JWT using, or at least I've never seen a JWT using a response. <laughs> okay, so we actually have a JWT in the response um, instead of just going with a J JSON web signature because we wanted to add a bunch of custom claims and we also wanted to determine um, what, who the issuer was, who the audience is, our hierarchical stuff on the response. We wanted you to at least be able to know what, who's responding and what they're responding about. So it had more state and it made a little more sense to us. Although, explaining it to people, they 
it gets a little weird for them because they're like, well, it's a J no, JWTs are for requests. That's a, that's, a, that's a bearer token, and we don't use it like a bearer token. Um, and like I said, we, we're, we're trying to utilize some of the existing stuff because now I don't have to make this thing to do this crazy stuff to verify that things are the way I want them to be, that the request isn't too old, that it's a, a unique identifier. I can just use the existing Jose libraries and they just handle it for me. So again, we do the signature, we put it in a custom token uh, coming back and we also use it that same header when we're sending things for uh, server sent events um, so that we don't, uh, so people who are implementing don't get caught with the auth header because they might have auth on their site <laughs> and bad things might happen if we pass them an auth token. Uh, again, the hierarchy credentials, the token ID nonce is echoed, and we have private claims for the response. So in the private response claims, we didn't do everything. If you've ever used, uh, so before we did JWT, we did something that a lot of people do. They go find successful APIs, and how are they doing it? And who is secure, and what are they doing? And on some of the older APIs that I worked on, Amazon's the one, right? So you go take a look, well, what is Amazon doing? And Amazon goes through and they, they have this little one header that tells you all of the headers that they're signing. <laughs> and then they have another header where you actually have the signing. Um, and you have, they have to be in a particular order and it's just kind of, it's, it's very secure, but again, harder to implement. So we decided that we want to do it this way in the JWT. And we've, we identified for our particular API and you could certainly use the same things, less or more, add what you want. These are the things in the, in the response that were important to us. Because what we don't want to have happen is someone to be able to impersonate a response. So status code is a big one. I don't want someone to be able to return a 400 invalid request and make you think there's something wrong with your API when there's nothing wrong with your, with your request. It's that someone's trying to prevent you from being able to log in. Uh, a cache control header. I don't want someone to uh, do a denial of service on us by being able to change my cache control header and telling you never to cache it or telling you to cache it for an hour when you shouldn't be. Uh, the location header for redirects, they can't send you to somewhere we don't want you to go. Uh, and then again, the body hash and the body hash algorithm. And so if you take a look at a standard response, right, it's got your status, content type is application Jose, um, letting you know that you're going to get that weird dotted uh, part in your body. Um, cache control, uh, location, which I just put in here for reference. We don't ever actually use it. Uh, and then again, we have the JWT. <clears throat> so then you have a response claim that echoes that. So again, we have the hierarchical credentials. The issuer coming back is actually the launch key API. The response is coming back from the launch key API <clears throat> and the subject and the audience so that I now know who the entity is that should be receiving this so in the Java world, one thing makes requests because it's going outbound and then something completely different might be getting the actual responses back from our server and events because they don't want those applications receiving incoming. Maybe in PHP world, we've done the same, I've done the same thing where you'll have all these applications that it's okay for them to go out, but you have this one application that receives incoming requests. And so when you're doing that, you know that, oh, launch key talked to me and it was, it's giving me a response for this particular audience uh, about this subject. And that's been super helpful for us on that piece. Again, the timestamp of the duration, that, hey, if it's more than five seconds old, this is bad. Someone's trying to do a replay. Uh, a nonce echoed back to you. So if you generate the nonce, you make the request, you get a response back and they don't match, you have an attack ongoing. Um, that was one of the, my favorite parts of the, <laughs> of the implementation is we wanted to try and figure out how to do that and then we realized that, oh, there's this JTI thing that nobody actually really uses, um, but it's super helpful, so we decided to use that for it. And then the validation. So in your response, right, this is kind of a standard response header. It's not the whole thing, but that entire response header and the response body, which I did include because it's too big, um, is completely validated and uh, represented inside the JWT. So the same thing we did with the request, we did again with the response, and so we have much better. And we encrypted data with, J encrypted data with JWE. Um, again, we got that JWK, the web key for giving you key rotation. Uh, we get the combination of RSA and AES encryption, so random keys and IVs for AES, super, or for doing large pieces of data and RSA to make sure it's super secure. Um, algorithms and modes, 
are always the same from the request to the response. Um, that's one of the things that we do is when you send us, if you encrypt data and you say I'm using AES-256 CBC, we return it back in AES-256 CBC because that's what you wanted. But we do allow a range. So we allow 256 to 512. So most users, 256 is good enough for them, but some people say I have to have 512. So if you want to get like FIPS4, you might want, you might want uh, 512. Um, or if you're a bank, you might want 512, right? Um, and we allow them to do that now. We couldn't before. We had to go with the fact that, well, not every language provides anything besides two, beyond 256. So we're just going to do 256. Now we have the option for our customers can choose, I want 512. And they can encrypt it 512, and we'll send it back to them encrypted with uh, AES 512. Um, right, you get the lane into that. So the example for a header is very similar to a JWT, right? You've got your key ID, you got, except you've got algorithm, and you've got ENC. So algorithm is determining what algorithm is used to encrypt the content encryption key. The ENC is the actual encryption protocol. So this one's AES-256 CBC, and the signature will be an HMAC with SHA-512. Uh, these are all listed. They're not super special. And something really cool that we'd never had before is that it actually tells you what is the content type of the stuff that's inside that's encrypted. I mean, that is so cool. Like, we, if, if we might be getting different kinds of data, I can just determine, oh, this is this data, and I can get it that way. So if we ever change it, so you might be able to use XML. If it's application XML, I know that this one's XML, and you deal with it that way. So that's something that's a, a really nice little addition that I'd never seen before in the encryption stuff, which is optional in JWE, but we use it because it's really nice. And so... The big conclusion for me, and I'm, I mean, I was talking about last night at the, the speaker dinner, like how I'm like really, really psyched about this because it made my life so much better. It made my code so much cleaner. Uh, it made my API so much more secure, right? So much more secure. Um, and we're using standards that are homogenized across, well, they're going to be homogenized across all of our platforms because it wasn't something that was specific. We didn't have to sit down like we did before and come up with something, well, we don't want to over-engineer this and come up with something that works for everyone because who has the time to do that, right? None of us have the time to do this massive, grand uh, encryption and signature verification system that's gonna work for all of our systems. We've got, you know, we have deadlines to meet, we have to get it done. Fortunately, there's working groups and a ton of people out there using Jose that are doing that for you. So libraries, as far as I know, there's only one full Jose library. So if you want to do the whole gambit, it's Spomky Labs. Um, but if you want to go, there's also another one. There's actually, I think, two more for JWT, but uh, there's only one that's just JWT that supports basically a, the full range and the validation of the JTI. And that's it. So <laughs> he'll be talking about it tomorrow afternoon here. I don't know if this room, but at the, at the conference. Um, please, 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 please rate this talk. Please rate this talk. Um, and if you want to follow up, if you have any questions, I love talking about this stuff. I can do it absolutely forever. Um, but all that said, are there any questions? I thought there might be. Yes. What you said you're using middleware to actually sort of dec decode the things. Are you using any particular tool there? So we're using just so using the Jose library, um, which is handling all of the encryption, decryption, all that type of stuff. So the first thing we do is when, the, when it comes in, we just have layered middleware. So the first thing that it does is it goes and it um, basically base64 decodes and URL decodes uh, the pieces to get the header and the JWT. And it determines that, oh, we have this is a, uh, a what type of entity it is pulls up that entity out of the database, um, and then determines, finds the key that it needs to do the verification on the signature, verifies the signature. So there's actually one piece that pulls out the entities, and then it moves to the next piece of middleware that goes and validates the signature based on the keys. And the next thing that it does is it verifies that this entity has access to that entity, and then another piece of middleware <laughs> that determines uh, if uh, this particular type of entity can access another type of, so we've got a, a bunch of different layers that go down, and then once we've validated that 
this is a, a valid authorization and a valid signature and a valid request, then we actually go and decrypt. Um, and then we just put that data on the request and ship it through. So when it gets to the controller, the controller, the controller just knows I've got a JSON object, I have a requesting entity, and I have a subject entity, and I deal with that. So by the time it gets to your controller and your actual code, you know it's a good entity. You know it, can, it should go off and action it. Does it also get all the information um, in terms of the, basically the payload? Is that, is that already? Yeah, so, so we, we attach, we do the database lookup on the entities. And so the issuer and the subject, those entities are attached as the issuer entity and the subject entity. So we don't have to go pull it up again. That was one of the big parts of our, uh, of our ability to handle more load is to reduce the number of times we look up entities. <laughs> um, so the, the middleware does that part of the validation process to get the keys. It actually looks up those entities and stores them in the request and it gets passed on. And then we have another piece of middleware that does validates the actual data that came across in the request. Uh, because we know the endpoint, once we, everything's valid, everything's decrypted, then we can actually do validate the data, and then once it gets to the controllers, it knows that it has a good, valid request with the proper data that's been properly sanitized, um, and then it just returns a response, and then the middleware goes in the reverse order, goes and encrypts it, and signs it, and then ships it back. Thanks. Can't see. Very bright light. I'll, I'll ask a question then. Uh, okay. <laughs> sorry. Uh, yeah, so um, taking the full Jose suite as it is, uh, you would essentially be, am I right in assuming you'd essentially be wrapping your entire communication in its own encryption layer beyond the need of HTTPS as well? Oh, we, uh, we do HTTPS as well. Well, you would, I know, but just Better. saying like, generally it's like another envelope of encryption that not necessarily saying it's up to the standard or the same, but it's certainly encrypted. Oh, it's yeah. up to the standard of, of SSL. So uh, SSL is um, RSA or ECDH, um, private, cut, private public key pairs, and it uses AES to encrypt the data. So you're basically using, if, you're use, if you do it using RSA or elliptic curve uh, encryption uh, using uh, AES 256 or better, you're, it's basically the same thing you're using inside of, uh, of SSL. Um, but for us, we know that man in the middle is possible and uh, we try and protect our customers. So if someone, if you're not building your, your system pinning to our SSL cert or pinning to our, uh, making sure that this is who we're supposed to be talking to, you have a man in the middle attack. So we make sure that you can never ever uh, view any of our authorization data. You can never get a username, all these things. So it's, uh, and that you can, you can't f just fiddle with response coming back. So, so because you can't pre-share a trust, you wouldn't be able to actually guarantee man in the middle being prevented with this? Well, the pre-share of the trust is the fact that, so SSL is an open network where you have uh, certificate authorities that you have to trust. So if I go and say, oh, hi, yeah, I'm this network and here's my certificate authority and you go verify against that, but it's not my, no, it's not my certificate and it's a different certificate authority. Um, if a certificate authority gets hacked, that's an open network for the trust. When you go to our dashboard and you upload your public key, so the trust is that you went to our dashboard, you upload the public key, nobody knows what those keys are, but you and me. So, so that's so your, the security. So your client publishes a public key to your API and then that's the... You know, right, and that's, that's what we use to encrypt you... and verify their signature. Is the one that, we, that they sent to us by logging into our system with authorization credentials that are valid. That makes sense, okay. Anyone else? It's really bright. Okay, if there's no more questions, uh, that's it, I think. All right, thank you. And if you have any questions at all, or it's a, like, it's a lot to sink in, and if you're thinking like, I might think about that, let me go look at it, I'll be here for a while. Go see his talk tomorrow if you're interested in the JWTs, because um, he'll get more in depth in JWT. Um, and yeah, absolutely just come see me anytime and talk to me about it, because I love talking about this stuff. Okay.